Okay. Mm. Well, sounds good. Yeah. Wait, so do they, does everyone see us now? Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. Sounds good. Very cool. Just to let you know they're hearing us, Jorge. See, I can disable my mic. Oh, I like that. You like that? You like that's that's rad. I was thinking like red could mean recording, and then if it's green, it's not hot. I don't know. That would have been that would yeah. be a cool thing to do too. Because I I've, yeah, the that would have cost. Yeah, yeah, that would have cost an extra thirty seven cents in LED <laughs> and current limiting resistor. So mm. I paid twenty bucks extra for that light. Worth it. Totally, totally. I mean, just to have that view. Oh yeah. You know, the. Yeah, I should have gotten a boom arm to come down from the top, so you wouldn't see the arm in the window. Mm. But... I thought about uh, it... hacking a, hacking one of those IKEA lamps to to like do that because yeah, before when like I didn't have gear, I was like I'm really into like IKEA hacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Oh, if someone... you if you pop into the as is furniture section, you know. The, oh, I the, love that. It's section. like that section on the way out the door. Man, you can get all manner of things you can hack. So I love. Yeah. yeah. So hi everyone. My name is George Garcia. We're joined by Kaching Song. He's product manager for Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty, and Matt Bergen who is in charge of a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so they're no pressure there. So they're going to be going over some of the new stuff in Fusion 360, um, especially the electronics uh, platform, and they're going to be going over some questions. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to them. And thank you guys for joining us on this, on this webinar, on this solder side chat. Ooh. <laughs> no, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, George. Uh, hey, hey guys, I'm Kaching. Uh, for those that don't know me, I've uh, been around for a, quite a while <laughs> and uh, made some mm -hmm. you, you videos in the past. Um, I'm also I also write a lot of the what's new for for Fusion 360. So you know, whenever we have an update, uh, the blog post has a what's new post. That's usually my work there, and and the team help out a lot there. So I have to also give credit to the team. Uh, I know that. A couple of weeks ago, we said, hey, we're going to do a live stream. Is anyone interested? So here we are. And we're um, pretty pumped to have Matt join us, too. Uh, Matt's <laughs> also a, a YouTube, a, quite a YouTube celeb, I would say. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, Matt, yeah, let's, why don't, why don't you uh, kind of introduce yourself a bit? And then yeah, so, so, <clears throat> yeah, so as Jorge, you know, mentioned, I, I, I run a bunch of different things, one of which is the platform for Fusion 360, but more recently, uh, a lot of my effort has been around Fusion Electronics. So I run the Eagle team uh, at Autodesk, and I've been over the course of the last I don't know, six, nine months, right, uh, feverishly trying to build out the electronics workspace and the software mm -hmm. and get that in there. So we had really the foundation for true whole product design and manufacturing and mm -hmm. and so that's really at the core of what uh what my team is focused on awesome 
Yeah. So I think part of part of what we want to start off with is kind of talk about you know, why are we why did we do this right? This is this is quite a revolutionary uh, step for us and also for the industry. Uh, yeah. Having electronic design in Fusion three hundred and sixty uh, is yeah is something that no one has ever done. Um, so like Matt, like you kind of talk about the value prop there. Yeah. So well, and and you know to be to be sure. Nobody's done it this way. Yeah. So uh, I, I, for for folks that don't know me, I've been around the industry for a really long time. If you use any other electronics design software package, myself or my team has been really instrumental in creating those things. So uh, I was at uh, Altium when the 3D visualization capability came out, and the uh, essential difference in this is that we really wanted to take this beyond visualization. We wanted to look at, can you respect the mechanical timeline? Can you build something in which we can use complex relationships like derives relationships mm -hmm. where we could leverage a sketch through the system, whether it's going from the, the electronics design through to the, to the mechanical to drive the enclosure, the enclosure driving it all the way back through to the electronics design. And then, you know, just, distinctions that we wanted to make uh you know i'll give you an example and this is just sort of eye candy you know we added the electronics library to the software and we added the package generator which we had originally in eagle mm. uh to uh to the software and one of the advantages of having the package generator in here is that uh we can not only build the components but where historically those parts, you know, feeding information from a, uh, from a manufacturer's data sheet uh, into it, those parts would be created and I would end up with a uh, 3D model that was probably a mesh model. Um, in this case, you can see we're actually building all of this on top of the Fusion API. So whatever we're creating here is actually respecting not just electronics design because this is following the IPC standard, it's building the components so it's solderable. Uh, and it's yeah. back to the IPC uh, to the IPC standard, but it's also respecting mechanical design in the right way. And it felt like, you know, visualization is kind of looking at a painting of the Grand Canyon versus staring down the cliff wall, right? Yeah. So this and is this is part of a game change, you know, for 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 the software. Totally. So uh, I I don't know if you guys saw what just happened. Matt just pulled in a package, <laughs> and. It just appeared in Canvas, and there's a whole timeline of how this thing is built from scratch. Like that's that's what is so exciting about this is that you're we're combining you know different disciplines. We're not combining disciplines. We're we're bridging dis different disciplines together so that it's all it's all associative. And, and well, you're and still you look, in the construction future. lines that we put here mm. are actually representative of the pad geometry. So uh, we're using yeah. construction lines to indicate the pad geometry. And then later we can use that to actually do an extrude when we do true solid body copper in the mechanical model. So if I bounce over to a mechanical model over here and I disable uh, just the, uh, we'll put some top layer copper on here. Uh, I disable, for example, the package. Uh, I'll just remove the package for a second here. You can see this copper that's actually here is extruded and that pad geometry right. is extruded from those construction lines. So there's this really cool, very interesting opportunity then to do things like uh, CNC, a mm -hmm. prototype of a board or, you know, as inkjet printing of circuit boards starts to come out, having the ability to do various kind of uh, inkjet processes or, you know, there's some 3d printing that's going on these days for, uh, for, for, uh, PCB conductors, mm -hmm. but I think increasingly there's going to be more emphasis on that and, and we'll be really there at the leading edge of it. So, yeah. you know, a lot of these things are, are uh, designed not just to be eye candy, where I think 3D visualization was very much uh, eye candy for a long time. Um, this is actually trying to cross into the, 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 the world of usefulness. So that if I run something like an electronics cooling simulation on the board, and I have a, a study enabled to do something like electronics cooling, can we actually use the copper geometry and mesh the copper geometry uh, for, uh, for a real cooling study? 
So if you knew anything about that package that I created earlier, this QFN, one thing that it has typically underneath it, and I can manipulate the package that I originally created to have it, is a large area of copper underneath mm. it, which is used to heat sink it. Mm -hmm. so we took a, a voltage regulator, compressed it into a really small package, and now we've got a bunch of heat. Um, I'm going to use copper underneath it and holes through the board as a natural heat sink using the PCB as a heat sink. How do I know that the connection there is actually going to dissipate enough heat? Um, you know, when you get into real product design and you've got to go through things like underwriter laboratories, or you've got to go through uh ce or any other type of certification that's going to qualify a product there's just a whole other dimension of problems that we could solve if we did this at the intersection of electronics and mechanics and mm -hmm. and, and if we took that seriously we didn't sort of shirk on that yep yep that's great thanks matt um and yeah i think that this this goes well with the whole philosophy of fusion right we're it's the the product development platform we're trying to you know, we're letting you did create something, uh, concept something all the way through manufacturing, this is definitely a really, really important step of it. Uh, so, okay, we just dove into some like, just some really <laughs> detailed stuff, which is awesome. Um, but let's, let's take a step back and kind of um, address, you know, the different communities. We have, we have Fusion users that are coming into this fresh. Um, Myself, you know, I, I did some electrical engineering in school, but that wasn't what I what I majored in. So some of this I'm coming in also new. Um, and then, you know, we've got Eagle users and electrical engineers that are familiar with this. So uh, hopefully in this session, we'll kind of address both both, uh, both communities and answer your questions. But um, so I guess one of the things, Matt, I would love to, to kind of dig into is, okay, what are the, what are the ways to start? something what are the ways to start sure. a de electronics design sure and there's i want to be clear to the eagle community there's a there's a difference in how we implemented mm. the relationships between documents here in the fusion environment versus what we did in eagle so eagle historically you would have a schematic and a circuit board document and the schematic is largely the symbolic representation of something so for the mechanical engineers that don't know much about a schematic and the reason we use a squiggly line for a resistor is because the longer the length of a wire, the more resistance it has. So that's a symbolic representation. It doesn't correspond to the actual package. I could buy that with pins going through the board. I could buy that where it was surface mounted on the surface of the board, top side, bottom side. It's lots of different packages, but the squiggly line just indicates that it's a resistor and it has some value, right? Mm. So historically, we've had these two worlds in the electronic space. One was schematic and the other was PCB. Schematic being the sort of invariant circuit level representation. When we uh, wanted to implement this in Fusion, Eagle, we had two files in the same folder. And if those two files had the same name, uh, a.sch and a.brd, we made the assumption that those two things were related. In Fusion, what we did is we created this new concept of an electronic design. And the electronic design uh, allows us to create a relationship between a schematic and a board. And I can create a new schematic if I want, but I can also link to an existing schematic. So I could actually, in this case, mm. have the same schematic linked in to this design. And I've got the schematic loaded here. I've got the schematic loaded here. Both of them are referencing V1. Both of them are stored in an electronic design and you can sort of see the hierarchy start to appear over here. If I save this one over here, we'll just call this uh, schematic uh, schematic B. I can actually take now and reuse the same schematic, but target it for a completely different PCB form factor. Now, also the advantage there is that I've got the downstream manufacturing capability, so I could target it also for a different downstream process. I could build a higher quality version of this that's machined aluminum, machined steel. I could build another version of it, which is going to be blow molded plastic, uh, lower cost, higher volume, mm. and use the same core schematic circuit and retarget it for different designs. Um, but once you create an electronic design, and I'll, I'll sort of start from scratch, uh, I can create an electronic design, create a new schematic, mm -hmm. 
And then the process is, and I, you know, I hate to out the electrical engineers in the room, but uh, you know, the process is really placing components and connecting them together. Mm. So, you know, grabbing a part from a library and just saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to grab a, uh, a, in this case, this is a, a uh, LED driver and connecting that to a microprocessor um, there'll be a collection of libraries which are included out of the box with the software. Um, mm -hmm. I can take my LED driver here and my microprocessor and connect those things together. Um, we did a few things to try to speed along the process of electronics engineering. So, uh, you know, really trying to look at some efficiency tricks that would make things a little bit more, uh, a little bit smoother, a little bit easier for users. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, if I'm going to create a bunch of different LED signals over here, um, and most of this was born out of the reality that I'm an electrical engineer. I've got a bunch of guys on the team that are electrical engineers. Uh, you know, if I say, hey, I want to break out select pins over here and kind of run down the list and grab my LED pins, uh, I should be able to break out my LED pins and, uh, and, choose which ones I actually want to break out oh. and just move them over. And what the software will automatically do then is just generate uh, the, um, and I'll do it for a couple here. Uh, we'll use pin name on this and it'll generate wires. It'll generate names. It'll automatically name stuff. Um, lots of little efficiency tricks that we yeah, just chose nice. to employ. Try to speed things up a little bit. Um, but basically, you know, some total of what we're doing on the electronic side is really connecting things together in interesting ways. The difficulty is knowing, uh, what those things are and how they work. Mm, and, uh, yeah. so, you know, you can create a schematic like you normally would in the electronic space, just grabbing components from the library. Uh, earlier I showed kind of getting into the library just by creating a new mm -hmm. electronics library. Um, Either way, it doesn't really matter what the entry point is. You're going to place parts, and then you're going to wire them together. Gotcha. Um, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty consistent with anything that you would expect from, you know, Desktop Eagle. You've got sort of classical kind of wiring. But we've done a lot to try to improve the overall workflow and simplify a bunch of processes that mm -hmm. we just felt were totally out of date or, or needed to be uh, significantly improved. Yeah. Now, you know, the flow of the experience, like you would expect in Fusion, you know, Fusion very deliberately in the toolbars, it's sketch and extrude, right? Leftmost, most important, most frequently used. There's a certain linear progression through the software, left to right. Mm -hmm. And we tried to do the same thing in the electronic space so that we would orient also mechanical engineers who may not have all of the same depth in electronics in a direction that kind of progresses left to right. So I would say that these first few are kind of the, the general purpose bucket, but from adding parts to wiring them together to potentially running a simulation on them to then going in and doing modifications, the progression left to right is intended to sort of give you a sense for what path you're on. Yeah. Um, I, actually, that, that was what I was going to bring up, Matt. I'm glad you're touching on this. Uh, and also you can see that you've got tabs here too. So just like all the other workspaces, yeah, things are oh, organized absolutely. in their tabs. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And grouped in ways that, uh, that should hopefully make things feel not foreign at least. Yeah. Now there are a few concepts which are a little bit rare. Like you see a couple of workspace panels that didn't exist previously mm. in fusion. I'll show you, you know, as an example, I can grab these, uh, labels over here. And there's an inspector panel, and the inspector panel is designed to operate on whatever the selected objects are. So if I decided from the inspector that I want to grab a group of objects and, hey, I want to make these, you know, XREF style labels, or I want to add all of these things to a net class, I can add them to a net class if I'd like. Uh, I can do things like rotate objects. This starts to get to be really, really important when you get into fairly sophisticated PCBs, and this is by no means a sophisticated PCB, but you know, I've got a bunch of parts in a PCB and I wanna rotate them around, I wanna flip them, I wanna do something. Um, it's really this combination of the inspector and the selection filter that enable 
a lot of these really clean type selection and editing operations and they persist. So, you know, grabbing a device or grabbing device here and drawing a bounding box, I should only get devices that are selected. Mm -hmm. And uh, filtering those devices and saying, hey, I just want to get all of my capacitors, which I happen to know start with a with C at the beginning of them, or maybe I just want my 10 microfarad capacitors and I want to perform some operation on my 10 microfarad capacitors, I can do that and have a set of dedicated operations that would occur that would apply just to that object. So uh, manipulating those objects, I could add attributes to them, maybe adding value properties to them, manipulating existing properties, locking them in place. Uh, it doesn't really matter so much, um, but the point is, is that I end up with this really nice selection and editing paradigm um, that makes it much easier for me to then go ahead and and uh, and and control editing of multiple objects. Because on a on a circuit board, there could be you know potentially tens of thousands of tracks or mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of holes, and there are lots of components. Uh, in a design that you want to navigate to. Um, one advantage in this is, especially when you start thinking about component placement, um, and this is one of the things that we added, I'll, I'll be a little bit whiz bang here, ka -ching, sorry. Um, no, so cool. one thing that we added for the electronic space was the ability to rip out a tab Ooh, so yes. that, you know, I could have, uh, and I'll use my uh, too cool for school kind of auto alignment tools here. But if I rip out the, the tab here, um, you notice that I've got PCB over here. I could have the equivalent schematic for this design uh, loaded up over here. And I'll get rid of the data panel here. So we got a little bit more room. Um, now, you know, my schematic naturally flows in an order that should be reflected in the PCB. This mm -hmm. signal connects into this, connects into this device, has you know some other components in there. This resistor feeds into that LED. That's the current limiting resistor for this. And splitting this across multiple screens and then having access to things like the design manager, I can start to navigate pretty quickly the components in the design and move around between different uh, different components within the design make edits to things and follow the circuit over here as guidance for how uh, how I should go through the process of editing something over here. Yeah, and then so, you, bring, you can bring it back by, by yeah, clicking that little Yeah, so I can collapse arrow. that back in and that should just dock back into the main work into the main window. That's awesome. So Matt, we're so, looking at a we're looking at a 2D PCB here, right? Correct. Uh what so how do we we get from that schematic that we first made into uh, to this. Sure, sure, sure. So you know, I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example with a sort of out of the box uh, mm. design here. So we'll pick up something like uh, this electronic design has a schematic, doesn't have a PCB link to it. Mm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and this button here, switch to PCB document, will actually generate the 2D PCB from the schematic. And it'll automatically generate it. It'll create a default board outline, uh, and it'll drop the components off to the side of the board. So again, you can imagine navigating between components within the panel over there as a sort of standard operation for moving around in the workspace. But gotcha. if I want to manipulate uh, the board shape, I can grab the edge over here. and I'll just kind of drag this in a bit. Uh, manipulating the, the board shape should be fairly straightforward. And there's normal kind of move tools and drag tools and those sorts of things. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, in probably two minutes or less, I can uh, <laughs> place parts on the board and get things kind of going, at least for this design. Um, yeah. I'll grab my, my light pipes over here too, which uh, uh, I know I'm, I'm pushing it, Kaching. I'm flipping things over to the bottom side of the board. The uh, <laughs> blue indicates no, the bottom side. Oh, yeah, yeah. So no, that's my, good. My battery connector and some other stuff uh, on the bottom side of the board. I should probably, if those are light pipes up there, I should probably put my uh, LEDs underneath the light pipes. One thing uh, One thing I learned, though, in. from from just coming at it fresh, um, that the, so the, like, the red, the red tabs that you see on the, on each part, um, yeah. Those are basically like soldered. They're 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 soldered contacts, right? The contacts that get soldered onto Correct. the board versus Correct. the green circles 
are through holes. So it depends on what you you guys want, um, you know, for your for your design. But there it is. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So so the solderable area, you have to imagine that there is the contact, which is the pin mm -hmm. of the part itself. And if we take a package like this, that contact is actually this here. Right. There needs to be an area in which solder would accumulate that would hold that contact in place. If that area is too large, we create short circuits. If the area is too small, you don't have a good enough adhesion and the high vibration, high stress environment, anything like that, eventually you might have, even if you don't have, what's worse than a completely broken contact is a contact that's sort of working, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a bit like blowing in your Nintendo to try uh, to, you know, yeah. get it to start, right? Um, Those this, days, everyone uh, was days. Oh yeah, yeah, they were good days. Um, but this, it, it, you know, you're looking for reliability in those things. Yep. Um, so even when we generate packages like this, we generate them according to an industry specification, which is dictated by an organization called IPC. And IPC says, hey, if you're going to have this thing and it's going to have this solderable, or it's going to have these pins, it needs to have this solderable area. So the pin will actually be generally smaller Mm. than the red or the blue here. Surface mount technology is pretty old technology. It's still relevant, but it uh, I mean, it certainly still has its place in the world. You know, we use it for connectors and things like that. And certainly for high stress uh, applications or, you know, anything like that, anywhere where you want mechanical stability, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you would use something which is potentially surface, or sorry, uh, through hole rather. Through hole, yeah, okay, um, yeah the you know the mechanical stability that we're looking for there in something like a mini usb connector uh you know if i make a choice between mini and micro usb it may just be on the basis of mechanical strength mm -hmm. if i have pins that are going further through the board or lugs going through the board to hold it in place that should hopefully ensure the fact that as the product moves forward uh i've got greater mechanical stability on it uh, you know, oddly enough, or maybe oddly enough, but, you know, micro USB is actually much more mechanically stable because it, it doesn't have the, the same Z-axis projection. And so you don't mm. have this tendency to tip because you have more flexibility in it. That um, is true. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's quite a bit in the way of, you know, piecing things together that, you know, I think about as an electrical engineer, I know mechanical, every good mechanical engineer I've ever worked with thinks about those same problems. Um, but yeah, uh, that was my way of soft shoeing through my, my circuit design. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was a good conversation. Um, uh, one, one question I did also want to just ask is, uh, so what if, what if like, say you're, you're laying this out and then partway you're like, oh man, really wanted this to be through holes instead. How would you change that? How would you train, change the, the oh sure sure so you know type yeah so uh you know if i right click on a part here i can say hey i want to replace this uh, okay and it'll throw me back into the library and i can replace that with something else i can say mm, i, gotcha. I don't yep. really want to use a resistor in that package i want to use it in another package mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. oftentimes what we will do is ship a bunch of different package geometries for the classic Eagle users, you're probably asking the question, well, you know, there seem to be a lot fewer libraries than what were in the previous versions. What we did is actually an audit of a bunch of the old libraries and looked at them and said, most of these, you can't buy the parts anymore. <laughs> um, and, you know, further to that, we we said the new normal is schematic symbol, circuit board footprint, mechanical model. If it doesn't have all three of those, it doesn't qualify anymore. So we've gone through and started adding mechanical models to all of the parts so that our LEDs look like LEDs. And, gotcha. yeah. um, and you can add mechanical models either through Classic Eagle using a sort of step file approach, but you can also add now uh, mechanical models from Fusion, which would allow you to put in, for example, an LED with an, uh, uh, some body in it that you apply a material to, give it an emissive property, mm -hmm. and turn it into an LED that when you throw it into the renderer actually looks like an LED lighting up. 
And I did the same thing with light pipes because I wanted to see if I could channel the light through the light pipes. And it looks like the ray tracer actually will follow the path oh, if you yes. do it right. So it's pretty cool because the light pipes will actually light up on the end, which I thought was Sweet. pretty slick. Yeah, it's just me nerding out on things. Um, it's the best. So, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, this is a relatively cool. simple board, mm. um, but the, you know, transition from this then into the mechanical space, and I'll, I'll create a couple of holes here. Uh, just oh, my keyboard is uh, flat. Um, grab. All right, we'll do this. Also, you do have a you do have a field up there too to to yeah, type in. Yeah, so there is a uh, command line yeah, in the software, line. and you can type commands into the command line. And mm -hmm. uh, there is an autocomplete on the commands. Uh, so you know, if I start typing something like technology, which actually changes the uh, the package, also gives you the ability to change package from gotcha, surface gotcha. mount to through hole. Um, but I can also do things like, you know, type grid and the grid will pop up. It actually uses a starts with function. So if you know anything about software, so if I just type GR and hit enter, oh, right. uh, it'll pick up the first two characters. Awesome. It actually harkens back to the early days of Eagle being largely based on, on Linux. So mm -hmm. You know, Eagle's native compilation environment was CentOS, and so a lot of what you see actually in some of the layer naming, as an example, uh, T stop, B values, B names, B origins, was to prevent an intersection of layer names. So you could use just the first two characters and say, I don't oh, have to check anything else. Gotcha. So there's lots of that kind of history, yeah. which is transitioned into the fusion environment makes total sense for the electronics engineer. Doesn't make any sense for a mechanical engineer coming into it. So there's, mm -hmm. there's definitely going to be a little bit of teething there. Yeah. Um, but uh, super, super powerful. Uh, once you know some of the, some of the tricks there. Yeah, for sure. And we're, uh, we're always updating our, our learn help and learning documentation too. So, you know, if you guys are uh, catch something that we're talking about here and uh, miss it or need to dig, Again, more, uh, yeah. Check out our our learning learning and help documentation website. Definitely, definitely. And we've gone to great pains working with uh, with the learning team to really make sure that a lot yeah. of the help documentation was updated. There was brand new tutorials for it. Um, you know, we're really trying to push in that direction to where there's better content and better resources. Awesome. Um, yeah. So okay, yeah, we so, looks like we got a board or uh, not a board, but a, yeah, a it looks like one. A board, it? yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, so um, it will just you know close PCB. Yeah, so I have another question. Yeah. Uh, not all boards look like rectangles. Boards can that's true come in all different types of shapes. We did something pretty <laughs> cool in Fusion that that is different too, right? Want to show oh, yeah, that yeah. off? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, well, we can go a bunch of different directions. With sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, let me jump into, actually, I'll give you a better example here. Um, was that kind of the flow that you were, you were thinking of, Matt? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. sweet. So, sweet. actually, let me, let me give you a, a, a pretty slick example, because I think this is one which is sort of, uh, it's, it's all too painful. Ooh. Um, <laughs> so this is a generatively designed body, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's graphics performance. Pretty. Uh, right there. Pretty. So that's a generatively designed body. You can imagine a couple of drone rotors landing on that body. You can imagine that maybe I want to put a PCB here with some downlights on it. Maybe the drone rotors mount on the top side. And I want some downlights on it so I can see my drone up in the air, uh, pick it out of the sky. Um, a uh, couple of really interesting problems. You know, first of all, there's some non-uniform faces here. There's a bunch of right. curvature, and and things aren't totally flat. There's some curve to the bottom of the inside of this thing. Um, some things that we really wanted to do were uh, enable us to. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, do a projection here. I'm going to grab some geometry and just project. Uh, a sketch from this and so you know for a pcb designer going from that non-uniform surface to something which is a pcb which is going to fit exactly in that shape in and of itself is painful and slow and, and mm -hmm. uh, typically involved somebody sending me a dxf file 
or a drawing that had lots of dimensions on it. Um, in this case, uh, I've taken now a non-uniform surface, flat, curved, got some right. oddball shape to it, um, and generated a sketch from it. And if I go over here now and enable my sketches, and I'll sort of expand this, this is a projected sketch down here. Yes. Um, from that sketch, to be able to then go ahead and create a PCB, historically, I would bring a DXF into my PCB tool. Whereas here, I can say, hey, you know what, I want to create a 3D PCB, and I'm going to grab uh, these profiles over here. And from those, go ahead and click OK, and I have a board. Boom. And it's yeah. sort of a, you know, let there be light kind of thing um, where, you know, now I have a PCB, that PCB is associated now in some way with that geometry. Right. And there's other techniques for maintaining that board shape actually in, in even more interesting ways. So like in this mm -hmm. case, there's no direct association. There's meaning that this board now isn't really associated with the drone body, mm -hmm. but if I save this and I say, you know, what I'm going to call this, uh, you know, drone board. If I save this and from here using the combination of these uh, sketch bodies, use a, a create derive approach, I can actually then create in the 3D PCB a relationship between that sketch shape mm -hmm. and the enclosure itself. So if the enclosure changes, the 3D PCB responds to the change, which then cascades all the way over to the 2D PCB. Yes. And derives are one of those things that mechanical engineers uh, are familiar with, many of them. It's a, it's a fairly complex concept if you've never really been introduced to it but as soon as you get it you're like wow okay that's really powerful mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. electronics engineers have never had that ability to derive from one geometry some element of that geometry to create something else right. in this case if i choose create derive uh I can save the design go ahead and click ok and what this will do is it will ask me what do you want to use for that derive if I grab that shape, which I created, which is sketch nine, and I say, I want to add to an existing design, I can now push this into the 3D PCB mm, and yes. then use that to regenerate the 3D PCB geometry. So uh, sticking that into there, I could say drone board, I'm gonna shove it into that. And what I end up with now is a geometry here, which was derived from yep. that drone body. Now, any change in the drone body would actually reflect as a change in the PCB. Caveat is, is I got to move my drive a little bit earlier in the timeline, right? Then I've got to come over here and for my board say, hey, I want to edit the board, but instead of using the outline, I want to use that sketch. And from that, then I end up with a PCB now, which is a reflection of that sketch. Yeah. Now, if the enclosure changes, the PCB changes. So this is allowing the mechanical engineer to drive that uh, PCB board shape. And that could go all the way from the T-splines workspace where you've got, you know, pushing and pulling of pixels through to, uh, to the PCB shape, because maybe it's the shape of the object, mm -hmm. like it would be in, let's say, a, a consumer toy or something like that, which is actually the defining characteristic of the product versus the other side, which would be to say, hey, the 2D PCB is going to generate the 3D. And in those cases, people are, are generally familiar with some aspects of that workflow. But you know, from here, if I just say, hey, I want to go ahead and bounce over from 3D PCB to a 2D PCB, I hit the button, and the software generates now a 2D PCB, which is a reflection of the board, yeah. uh, that 3D board. So there's this relationship now being driven from the mechanical design and using the create derive, I actually maintain this associativity between that 3D PCB, the mechanical PCB, and the mechanical design. That's so, so cool. I mean, I think what you just showed is uh, you, you've essentially used tools that we've had in the product and tied them all together. And this is why we yes. 
we this is why we we deliver these tools right this is why we did it derive exactly. this is why we did create 3d pcb from that uh create drop down it all ties together and now you've got exactly. a, an associative design that you know removes a lot of that those pains where if you, you didn't have this before you had to go manually update each and every one of those things and it's a, just a, it's a pain um so that that's yeah. what we that's what we want to do is relieve well and so from the electronics design now because all of these are now contained within the same project and in the same folder of the same project yeah you can create a new electronics design which can leverage as i mentioned earlier i could leverage the same schematic but target a different form factor so in this case you know we were talking about downlighting on a on on uh the drone I can include the schematic, which is contained over here in this design, repurposing a schematic, but say, you know, from this, I've got the top level design, click save, we'll just say uh, drone design. So the schematic now is in there. I can also link then to the drone board, which I created. And that would also then get linked into this existing design. And you'll notice mm. that as soon as I do that, the components that were contained in the schematic now propagate through to PCB. Now I can start moving components around and saying, right. oh, okay, you know, I've got parts that I got to move on the board here um, and, uh, you know, filter, I'm grabbing some of these uh, and start tossing parts around on, on mm -hmm. to my uh onto my drone geometry um so you know it's really really powerful um what we're capable of achieving with it uh you know i'll flip my leds to the bottom side right because i said that my leds were gonna shine through on the bottom side and you start to get a sense for um just how powerful some of these things yeah get. uh and then the other the other thing much. let me just yeah. show you the the you know, now if I push this from 2D over to 3D, I start getting parts associated with it. The parts will load in. Oh uh, yeah, it's coming in. It's coming in. Parts will load in. <laughs> I start with parts on the board and wow, magic. All models. Yeah, that is all modeled awesome. all the way through the system, where the enclosure will drive the geometry now of the 3D PCB. Mm -hmm. So super powerful. That's so cool. The other thing I, I, I was thinking of around like board shapes. So this is definitely one way, a really powerful way to edit board shapes and like just do it in, mm -hmm. in the, in the, from a derive and from the three geometry. But I think we also added some, uh, some shaping tools like lines oh, and specifically yeah, yeah. splines, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually that's, yeah. Sorry. And I, I, I was, getting ahead of myself with no, uh, no, no, it's with cool. complex board I mean, geometry. This... But um, yeah, so, you know, a number of things that we went ahead and added, bouncing back over to my, uh, we'll go into my uh, schematic here. Um, if I bounce over into PCB, I just mm -hmm. create a pretty yeah, lame PCB, there, see, yeah. right? We added both a straight polyline and then spline curves. And this is one of those things which you have to imagine the interplay between electronics and, and mechanics mm -hmm. for a long time. No electronic design package truly supported splines. We would do a piecewise approximation of complex curves. So if you sent me something that had splines as a DXF, I would invariably as an electronics engineer say, explode those and then mm. send it to me. And what I end up with then is this complex polyline that was really hard to manipulate, really hard to control. So, uh, you know, in this case, I can actually use, uh, and I'll go in my select command over here. I can use spline curves to do uh, more complex board yeah. uh, geometries, uh, manipulate more complex board geometry um just grabbing you know spline command and starting to draw you know spline curves throughout the board um and let me i'm gonna bounce over actually i don't oops, sorry i wanted to save this um i don't know why i was trying to close that uh so the other side of that which i think is really important is that that then would allow oh i deleted the board outline <laughs> 
But it would push it would push that change through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would push a change through. But the more important thing is, is that if I'm in the mechanical environment, and I decide that I want to create something which also mm. includes splines within the geometry. I can use the splines to generate a geometry now, which then cascades through to the uh, to the PCB. Mm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, saving something with splines in it, when I get it back from the electronic space, the splines don't go away. We don't right. explode them. So you still have the same control points, the same fillets, the same kind of, you know, managing of, uh, or control, you know, control points and control handles, same managing of that that you would mm -hmm. expect in, in other experiences. So, um, and uh, spline board, I could almost call this Patrick star, but not quite. Um, so yeah, grab a PCB from that create a 3d pcb create a 2d pcb and we'll generate it but the curves will actually be maintained and respected as curves nice so we'll actually yes. maintain the curve geometry and be able to manipulate the curves mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. as splines so that's rad yeah the 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 introduction of splines was actually a big deal you know it wasn't something that was uh was trivial and it's also not something that we intend to stop with mm -hmm. uh the intent would be eventually that those splines should be able to support any type of vector, anything. Yeah. Uh, so if I wanted to draw a complex silkscreen, solder mask, whatever, um, create complex shapes using spline curves. Um, polygons will support splines pretty quickly, um, but I can also you know, truly convert the board outline. Say I want to uh, go ahead and create a top layer polygon and pour the polygon and the polygon now adheres to the curve as well and follows ah, okay yeah so i can fill the top of the board with copper if i want and flood spline curves uh that way got it that's awesome so glad yeah, so, to have that yeah and we will you know for the eagle users that think that we're you know running from eagle uh headlong into fusion and there's no hope for you spline curves will actually come out in desktop eagle uh here pretty quickly we're working on that release right now so there mm. will be an update to desktop eagle to also support that because it doesn't make sense that we would leave the eagle users in a lurch um we really want that communication between eagle and fusion to persist for mm -hmm. as long as it takes to convince people that there's a better approach and that that really uh is is part of the trust equation yeah you know we've got to get past a certain threshold with capability functionality features that sort of thing yep makes sense hey matt so um want to touch on one more thing i think we're we've got like 15 minutes left so we want some time for mm -hmm. uh questions but um when you showed the at the beginning you showed a board with the autodesk logo on it i think that's our like the the yeah. um air sensor board so that board yep. has different colors so it's not a green board it's a black board and it's got different mm -hmm. colors on it um how yeah, so you do you control how, yeah. all of the solder mask color color of the board that sort of thing mm. um, from within the 2d pcb editor mm. and part of the reason we do it in the 2d pcb editor and and just for everybody's benefit and understanding this the 2d pcb must be the canonical reference for the 3d pcb because that's where we generate manufacturing files. Mm, okay. If we were generating manufacturing files from something else, Gerber files, drill files, all the NC tooling stuff that we need for the board. If we were generating that from somewhere else, then those two could be out of step with each other. Um, and and uh, so instead, anytime that you make a change in 3D or you make a change in 2D yeah. and you go to save, it'll prompt you with a message that says these two things are out of date we're doing that on purpose and we're going to keep doing that because we want to condition people with the reflex that these two things are absolutely essential to be in sync the 2d has to be the canonical source so that yeah. being said colors get into your question um colors are here under the cam preview uh if i open up the cam preview right now i'll see the board with the colors that I chose for that board. Mm. Uh, I can manipulate those colors and say, I want the copper color to be something else. Mm -hmm. Silk screen color to be something else. Solder mask could come in and it's normal kind of ugly green. 
Um, I'm kind of not a fan of the green anymore. Um, and manufacturers can mix custom colors too. My, you know, my, my feeling is don't get too clever with it. <laughs> uh, you know, Osh Park purple, I think is actually one of the, uh, official colors that we had in there. I can't recall if it's this one. I think this is the one that we mixed specifically. No, it's not that one. There's a, there's a slightly darker one, which, which we mixed specifically because of the guys at OSH Park. Um, oh, wow. We've got a good relationship with those guys. We felt like, you know, the least we could do was, uh, was include their solder mask color mm. uh, in the board itself. Um, I think it's actually maybe this one here. Yeah, it looks more OSH Park. Um, but this is all color yeah. at this point. Yeah. Now, because we have real geometry coming across, at some point, you're going to want to be able to associate materials with things. And this is part of the ongoing effort that, mm. that we're going through right now is trying to get to a place where you have that level of materials awareness, uh, appearances, both for rendering mm -hmm. um, and then also to communicate better with a manufacturer. Um, hey, this is what it should look like. And this is what you sent me. You know, that's not really the RGB that that we talked about. But, right, right, right. Um, so, you know, manipulating those colors, if I, you know, I go ahead and close this, uh, you know, if I were to generate that and throw it over to 3D PCB, and this one's locked, but I can do that with a, with a different board if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, generate something, send it over to, to, uh, to 3D PCB, I can uh, generate it and change the color and, and have that color reflected. Um, uh Oh, back into the 2D. the 2D. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, so yeah. well, so so that's part of the the future sort of synchronization option or right, operation. Right, right. So, in this case, like I've got green here. Yeah. Okay. Kind of eh, unremarkable. Um, go into manufacturing. Change my color here. Nod to my friends over at OSH Park. We'll throw in this color. Uh, there we go. Yeah, it looks like an OSH Park board. Uh, and then go ahead and throw this over to uh, the mechanical space and we'll recalculate then the solder mask color. And what we're doing with the solder mask actually is kind of interesting. It's, it's actually a negative extrude. So it's Z axis negative mm. uh, versus uh, Z axis positive. So the solder mask actually has a height to it. You can see the edge. Mm -hmm. And that height is going to be important later when we start talking about doing things like signal analysis. And we say, well, this has a dielectric constant of this and the thickness of the material that's going to be applied and the conformal coating is going to be this. Um, those properties, those materials become really important for things like the physics of good signal analysis, uh, the physics of heat dissipation and radiation mm. uh, of heat away from a surface. How hot is it going to be? If you think about somebody building a baby monitor, if it's 50 degrees C, when you touch it, it's, it, it's not really the kind of thing that you want hanging over the crib wall, right? So we've got a lot of those kind of things uh, to think about. And yeah. I know we're short, uh, you know, we're, sh we're short on time. So I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to ignore people's questions because I'm sure people have plenty of questions and we should probably get, uh, get in there. Um, I, I do want to mention one thing, Kaching. You know, part yeah, yeah. of the effort here was the improvement of the performance. Yes, yes, that's a good thing that in mentioned. general. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning to folks that you know this sort of like Zoom performance. I'm going to nauseate everybody over the internet, depending on what their frame rates are. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of Zoom performance, highlight performance, in which as I move across a series of connections, I actually see the individual edges start highlighting. Hitting that highlight performance really meant investing time in the whole of Fusion mm -hmm. uh, and really investing time in graphics, investing time in how we organize things in the tree to make sure that we have things well organized. To take that board and roll it and tumble it at 25 frames a second or 30 frames a second is totally non trivial. Yeah. And, uh, and yet we're doing it. And we're doing it effectively and you know at a 15 frame per second frame rate uh the uh the the it, it's gonna probably not look as hot 
on your computers watching it through the through the webcast but if you want to have a look take a look at the electronic samples yeah yeah, yeah. which we included with the software and uh you'll see those uh listed down here we included several of them there's a uh, fidget spinner one-dimensional pong my personal favorite uh and an air quality sensor um and the air you quality sensor yeah. is the one that you see here yeah yeah and for anybody that attended Autodesk University and built something in the factory, built the air quality sensor, this is the board from it. Yes. Um, and uh, that PCB is there with the schematic and, and such. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a great thing to touch on, Matt. I'm glad you brought this up because yeah, the, the, there's definitely, we've invested a lot of time and, and a lot of teams are working hard on getting that performance up and, you know, yeah. having seen, seen all those, uh, all those traces, copper traces, and all those trace bodies as models. Yeah, just think bodies. about how many edges that is, right? Those lot, are so yeah. that's solid. It's not mesh, mm -hmm. right? That's not mm -hmm. uh, throwing this uh, into the render pipeline and saying, "Okay, render, you you solve it," because we don't know how to. So that yeah. also is one of the big differentiators from all of the three D visualization stuff, because now once we have that, we can mesh it for thermal simulation one way, for CNC machining another way. Yes, we could do maybe a voxel based mesh for something like electronics cooling, if we wanted to, where we know in the PCB, most of our change, or most of our, our geometries are gonna be rectangular solids. So we can have more efficient meshing, more efficient instancing of certain things, and really then drive more efficient simulation at some stage because the, the bodies just lend themselves to that sort of cubic uh, feel. So that yep. cubic geometry. So lots of really interesting things there. Yeah, and you know that we're we're only improving from here, so it's gonna get better. Uh, we're working on uh, constant improvements, enhancements to the tools. So yeah, uh, yeah, we're just really pumped to share this with you guys. Uh, I hope this session was useful for you, um, Edwin or uh, George. Are there are there specific questions that we can answer with the the time we've got left? If not, uh, we can. I think we just we scored some it. points on, uh, on conference call bingo. <laughs> yeah, sorry right. about that. I was uh, I was on mute. I had to find. Oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, so far, <laughs> uh, we've been able to cover almost all the questions on the chat so far. Mm. So let me see if any actual anybody else puts it here. Um, cool. Okay. Cool. So the only one I see here. Um, uh, the future of Eagle on Linux, Matt, this guy is towards you. Yeah, so I think the you know first of all we don't have any reason to. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it happens sometimes. It, it was at the end, Matt. It it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, somebody brought up the L word, and you know that <laughs> that triggered a whole downstream series of events. No, you know, there's no reason for us to retire Eagle on Linux. Eagle's native compilation environment is CentOS. So we write code for Eagle on Linux. We compile on Linux. Um, whether or not Fusion, uh, whether or not the electronics workspace, because I think at the root of that question is whether or not the electronics workspace in Fusion would one day support Linux. Mm -hmm. I think the answer is we'll wait and see. Um, I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a long lead time type right. discussion. I wouldn't want to set right. expectations with folks yeah. that, um, that that's right. in the cards at this stage. The reality is, is that there's so much going on there, uh, that we, um, we, uh, would need to consider in the overall scheme of things, but it, the compatibility between Fusion and Desktop Eagle doesn't depend on operating system. So you can still use Eagle on Linux and you can still use Fusion 360 and you're entitled to both. And you can still synchronize between the Linux version of Eagle and Fusion running on Windows or Mac or whatnot uh, without any issue at that level. So, you know, if you run native Linux, depending on the machine that you have, if you boot to Linux, uh, you could virtualize Windows to run Fusion. That'd be kind of ugly. But you could also have Windows and, and virtualize Linux, which would be much lighter weight and more performant for running Eagle. Eagle doesn't create the overhead. So running Eagle in a virtual machine environment um, would be super, super fast. And then you would have native graphics performance uh, 
like you would expect for uh, for something like Fusion that would happen in the Windows environment or on Mac OS. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, I don't have any other questions, only uh, good comments in regards of it was a great chat between you two so far. Um, <laughs> so, awesome. Thank you both. And then... Um, and then, uh... oh, yeah, I mean, we're we're happy to 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 do these. Uh, we love talking to you guys and sharing, nerding out, nerd out with you all. Uh, we this yeah. is the this is the best part of our job. So <laughs> yeah, this Always is happy to nerd too. out. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I don't. So... Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. No, I was just going to say, so yeah, and you know, we'll increase the, you know, we'll continue to increase the frequency of conversations about things. Um, I really want to encourage the feedback from the community. Mm. Um, if there are specific things that you're struggling with, challenges, whatnot, um, you know, every one of us is on the support threads, every one of us is on the forums, um, and uh, we're in the thick of producing a lot of content. So. Uh, you know, this example uses insert derive, and I just created a video yesterday, which we'll put up that shows insert derive. We'll do some stuff with create derive, yeah. help people to understand the relationships and some of the more sophisticated capabilities. These are core capabilities of Fusion that if you're not using them today, once you understand them, you're going to be really excited about it. Well, yes. I would hope. Yes. Good so, shout. Yeah. Big shout out to Fusion. So I'm adding um, uh, a link to the Fusion 360 Electronics Forum. Awesome. So yeah. I would like to encourage anybody to uh, keep the conversation going in our forum. Please join us there. Uh, we want to keep this going. And uh, your input, I'd like to find out more what you thought of the presentation. And let us know if you have any other ideas of or webinars or tutorials that we should um, add uh, to, our, to our schedule. Matt? Uh, Kikin, thank you so much for taking care of this. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so far, I don't have any other questions, so I think we could end it right here. Any awesome. final thoughts, Matt, that you would like to say before we uh, go ahead and close the session? No, no. no. I mean, you know, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the community trusting us in in you know looking after Eagle. That Thanks, is everyone. awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kachin. Thank you, Thanks, Matt. Guys. Everybody, have a great day. All those that participated, greatly appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Bye now. Thank you. Bye, Matt. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yep. Bye now. I think we're off.